All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, today is still the 28th of July, 2013, and we're going on with 136, Esoteric Astrology Adventure, number 136A. Um, uh, we're on page 546, and we've been talking about the purpose of uh, Germany's attack on religion. It's not to establish a better approach to divinity, not that at all. We're talking about the destructive power of Pluto and how it destroys certain thought forms, um, how at times it is this is necessary, but not necessarily leading to the dissolution of the form of man. It's the triumph of death, but not necessarily physical death. And it frequently uh, is frequently the death of or ending of old forms of civilizations, which cyclically come and go, of religious teaching when it does not serve the need of the spiritual uh, nature, of educational systems. So I'll put that down, the ending of old forms, and the, um, the ending of certain religious teaching, which is unsuitable for progress in the present times, and the ending of educational processes which fail to educate the developing nature of man. Okay. Um, now, he's not talking about the death of religion or of forms of thought. Death as the great release, the great releaser which shatters the forms which are bringing death to that which is embodied. This is so important because uh, living possibilities are contained within forms which stifle them and they can have no true expression. Now Germany, it is said, responded to a philosophical death in its lowest aspect. They sought the destruction of religion except for certain of the ancient religions with which they seem to have more affinity as they tried to reestablish the prominence of the ancient uh, Teuton, uh, godlike man. So this was to evoke the ancient gods such as they appear in the Wagner operas, and Hitler took this very seriously. He says their Nazism is unthinkable without Wagner. So they sought to evoke the ancient gods and to deify the forms of matter and to make the state supreme. These are the uh, three factors which Nazism tried to instill um, and to uh, invert all spirituality. It was an inverted Shambhala impulse to which they responded, and they sought really to take man away from a true spiritual contact. Okay. <clears throat> now we're talking about the approach of Russia which is atheistic, and he says the completely atheistic approach of Russia to the problem of religion at the time of and during the period of the revolution is much more sound than the German approach. The spirit of man in its essential divinity can be trusted to arise unhurt from the experience in answer to the call uh, of the undying spirit. So perhaps a type of humanism entered and worship of a, a deity, the worship of which was surrounded by so much uh, glamour and false egoistic expectations. These things were put aside with the idea that religion was the opiate of the masses and kept them from facing their situation in a realistic way. The undying spirit will always sound its call, and if uh, atheism prevails for a while, it cannot hurt, we understand, the undying spirit uh, within man responding to the truly undying spirit. So this call can sound forth clearly in a void and be evoked by time and circumstance, unopposed, if the only difficulty with which it is confronted is the spirit of agnosticism and an attitude of questioning. Okay. So 
was the atheism of Russia, which really doesn't seem to exist now at all, simply a powerful disbelief in any possibility of um, a deity or of a religious dimension? Or was it really a spirit of not knowing, of agnosticism and an attitude of questioning? If that's the case, the door is still open. But if there is a uh, virulent opposition to the possibility of divinity, then in a way we have another belief system, don't we? Uh, distinguished by uh, a non-belief in deity which is just as strong as the belief of the believers. But as D.K. says here, but the imposition of the ancient myths in an effort to steal the demand for truth and the carefully planned attack upon the Christ of the world is dangerous, evil, and will cause retrogression. So it was here the imposition of the ancient myths. They had long outlived their usefulness. They can be interpreted interestingly in terms of modern possibilities, but it is uh, amounts to an attack on the hierarchy, an attack on the Christ, and on the plans of the Lord of the world for the externalization of the hierarchy and the Christ reappearance, uh, the plans for the emergence of the second ray soul. It's a retrogression back into uh, the third aspect of divinity and the rule of matter, dangerous evil and will cause retrogression. Of these, the rulers of Germany were guilty. They did not succeed in quenching the spiritual life of the nation because uh, religion in Germany was not corrupt as it was in Russia and needed not such a drastic purification. So, in fact, they could not stamp out what was a relatively pure approach, apparently. These are points which thinkers would do well to remember. In mystical Russia, the seeds of the spiritual life are emerging to fresh beauty and a triumphant religious ideal is on its way to manifest. And this uh, now, many years later, 60 or 70 years later, we see this emerging. In Germany, ancient crystallized forms of belief are met with something more ancient still. And the combination of world dislike and decadent forms will make the lot of the German people one of great tragedy. Well, perhaps uh, they have thrown, whoops, perhaps they have thrown this off. It might be the case. So uh, we seem to find uh, that these, the seeds of the spiritual life, um, the spiritual life in Germany was not completely stifled. I don't know where it stands today, but perhaps more the fourth ray soul has entered into the um, entered into the picture. So, if we, if there was a devotion to the ancient crystallized forms of belief. Uh, and met with something still more ancient, the combination of world dislike and decadent forms will make the lot of the German people one of great tragedy. This seems to have been uh, avoided in the post-war period. In the consequent struggle for that which is spiritually alive, and in the effort to regain belief in the realities of divine revelation, and in the determination to right the evil wrought by her rulers to the world, Germany may some day regain the expression of soul life. And perhaps this will be in this fourth ray period when from 2025 the fourth ray is uh, entering again in its monadic aspect, probably stimulating the fourth ray soul of Germany and perhaps through uh, beauty and art, this uh, contact with spiritual aliveness, with divine revelation, uh, and the determination is there to right the wrongs of her rulers. Perhaps uh, Germany is beginning to regain its soul life. We'll see, starting in another 10 or 12 years, 
as the fourth ray begins to come in more powerfully. Uh, to this end, she must first be released from the evil rule, which obviously was not yet the case when this was written, and then aided to regain uh, her spiritual standing. It was high. There was a great uh, philosophy. There was a great um, philosophical uh, religion, a pantheism uh, through Goethe and other philosophers. Um, the connection with India was very strong. The rays are the same, only reversed. The fourth ray soul, first ray personality in India, the first ray soul and fourth ray personality. And the, the Aries rules the, um, rules the soul of both India and Germany. So there were many spiritual stirrings which uh, Nazism stifled and perhaps they can be somewhat regained. Uh, the uh, recourse to the ancient crystallized forms of belief um, will not serve, nor will the evocation of the ancient uh, gods who have, in a way, no more place in man's modern spirituality except as they symbolize processes through which all must pass. Pluto, therefore, comes into full force and expression. We're still dealing with Pisces, right? Still dealing with uh, Pisces and its ruler, Pluto, and their effect in the modern world. Pluto there comes into full, therefore comes into full force and expression in order to stage the testings of the world disciple and to this end brings in the potency of Scorpio, the sign of discipleship. So we have to realize that <clears throat> when a planet is potent, it um, brings through the influence of the signs it rules. And in this case, Scorpio. There was some place here where there was a scene, a rulership uh, of Aries by Pluto. There was a definitely close association. Uh, we do have Aries, Pluto, Shambhala as a potent triangle. And uh, that which uh, ends the old and begins entirely in a new and resurrected manner um, this is uh, this is Pluto and its relationship to the sign of new beginnings and resurrection uh, is very strong, the end and the new beginning. So under these influences, the death of forms must eventually, must eventuate leaving the disciple free. Pluto, we understand, never destroys the consciousness. The dissolution of old group structures of thought embodying worn-out ideas and ideals, must necessarily supervene. Crystallized old forms must dissolve and disappear. Um, we have uh, Uranus causing uh, a breaking apart, a shattering. We have Neptune creating a dissolution. It dissolves what must go. And Pluto, um, pulverization, we might say, reducing everything um, to a non-formal state. But in their place, the undying spirit, impressed by revelation and sensitive to the emerging new concepts of truth, will create the needed new forms of appropriate expression. We have to remember that uh, Pluto means death, and um, regeneration. So the phoenix rises from its ashes. So there will always be a kind of uh, always, there will be a promised uh, rebirth with uh, the influence of Pluto and hence its strong connection as well to Aries in which everything uh, begins anew. So the death of forms must eventuate leaving the disciple free. Okay. So we've seen how these um, three um, 
signs or constellations are operating in today's world. Uh, the Pluto factor was very strong in relation to Germany because, as I said, there is an association of Pluto with Aries for the reasons given, and Pluto is the ruler of uh, Pisces, which is the personality of the German people, which was uh, set up for destruction and a kind of rebirth uh, by uh, the efforts of the leaders to go down a path that was that invoked the Black Lodge and was filled with uh, the densest type of uh, glamour and retro activity. Imagine hearkening back to a time some 250,000 years ago in the uh, occult theorization of some of the leaders and those who had inspired the leaders, that retrogression back to the true uh, and uh, masterful psychic Teuton was what they sought. It was interesting, um, people have asked, why was it that the leaders of the German nation looked so very much unlike the master race which they idealized, and perhaps there was a great inferiority complex in many of them, and they were living out a fantasy uh, concerning how they might uh, be transformed into this glorious Teuton, because they did, after all, believe in uh, reincarnation, so many of them. They had some kind of occult background. Hitler did, for sure. Uh, Himmler did. I don't know so much about the others. Uh, but the idea of reincarnation, I think, was strong with them. Uh, I believe that uh, Himmler fancied himself to be a great German king of some 900 A.D. who drove back the invading hordes from the east, from Russia. Um, this was how he fantasized uh, about his nature. The reality was quite different. He was actually... Uh, a rather strange-looking man, and he was involved in agriculture and chicken farming and things of that nature, a, a huge contrast between the idealized image of uh, himself. Was it, uh, did he see himself as Frederick Barbarossa, something of that nature? And the, um, the great invasion of three by three million German soldiers of Russia uh, was called Operation Barbarossa. So there was a huge inflation of ego involved in so many of these people, and they compensated for their very uh, evident failures and even ugliness by seeking some idealized um, Teutonic form. Uh, some of the um, worst inquisitors are those who feel to a degree tainted by the very thing they persecute. Such was the case with... Uh, Torquemada, who is said to have been uh, partially uh, of Jewish ancestry, and even uh, this is thought to be the case with Hitler. And one of the most um, hateful and uh, vicious uh, of, the, um, of those who sought the final solution with respect to the Jews, um, his name was... Uh, Reinhardt, Reinhardt. It's, um, Reinhardt Heydrich is what it was, and uh, he was part of uh, determining the uh, liquidation of the Jews and the final solution. Uh, it's interesting how many H's there were. Hitler, Himmler, Heydrich. He was not a member uh, of the group of seven, but he was very influential, and I believe that uh, Goebbels named his children all with an H in a rather devoted, uh, devoted following of the H of Hitler. So there was so much twisted psychology and glamour going on with that group. It had to be destroyed, and the, the Pluto-Pisces uh, combination saw to the destruction, I suppose, with an airy soul and a, a ray that corresponds to uh, the ray coming into power in 2025, there will be a rebirth in Germany. In a way, there has certainly been an artistic uh, 
rebirth. Probably there's still much to go through because uh, the Tibetan sees these things from the occult perspective. So a great um, eradication of ancient forms, including the type of ancient form which uh, Hitler and his group tried to impose upon the psyche of Germany, taking quite literally the, uh, the operas of Wagner. Of course, maybe Wagner responded to those things as well. And he was also a notorious uh, anti-Semite. Um, Wagner said that the Jews should do everyone a great favor and incinerate themselves. And, of course, that's precisely what happened later. They didn't do it to themselves, but uh, they and many o others died in the uh, crematoriums um, in the death camps. Well, these are the influences, uh, such are the influences which today are dominating the world. So what DK has done is he's taken uh, Leo, Capricorn, Pisces, and given them uh, a uh, an or uh, an understanding, given them uh, an interpretation which uh, relates directly to the period in which uh, he was writing. So, such are the influences which today are dominating the world, uh, peaking in 1945, finding expression according to the type of vehicle which reacts to the impact, the type of consciousness, conscious response, and resultant activity is, as the occultist well knows, dependent on the quality of the vehicle which is receptive to the approach of any type of energy. The same energy will produce, we know, very different effects in different types of energy systems and mechanisms, surprisingly so, even apparently contradictory and opposite effects. The interplay of the energy and the vehicle then produces consciousness of some kind, and this is the basic and unalterable law. So we have had um, several, let's see, two or three different visits concerning this great triangle of Leo, Capricorn, Pisces, three, I think, three different sections that have dealt with it. And this, by far, is the most practical of all and dealt with uh, immediate world affairs. Maybe uh, as a triangle, we no longer have to consider these three working together, but we certainly have to consider them uh, working in their own way. And uh, they seem so general, in a sense, stimulating the, the uh, head center and the base of the spine or the adrenaline of the throat and the solar plexus and heart that somehow it seems that they must still be active in stimulating the disciple, but maybe not to the same degree uh, as they were uh, in the middle 1940s. He did say after 1975 they would die away. And that's interesting because that was the year of the uh, first Shambhala impact occurring after the year 1825. So we've already had two Shambhala impacts since then. That's uh, If you think about two Shambhala impacts within 25 years, this is a remarkable uh, stimulation and the world of humanity is doing all it can to retain its balance, probably very much with the help of the hierarchy that is offsetting some of the more difficult possibilities. In the few things which I've been able to say and end these constellations and their relation to our planet at this time, I trust I have made clear and practical something which esoteric astrologers need unceasingly to grasp, the fact that once it is established which constellations are at any time uh, influencing our Earth, which planets, uh, exoteric and esoteric, are transmitting their influence and which rays are consequently active, it should be possible to prove the fact of these distributed energies by the appearance on Earth and among men of their appropriate results and expected response. 
people will be able to see that that in this manner um, these sources are interpreted and these are the very things that are happening on the world stage. So we have to know these connections. Uh, we have to know uh, which are the constellations which are potent. No doubt when he comes out again with more work uh, on esoteric astrology, he will tell us perhaps of new constellations which have uh, swung into an effective relation with the Earth and perhaps new planetary triangles. So if we know which constellations are at any one time influencing our Earth, which planets, exoteric and esoteric, are transmitting their influence, okay, as a result of knowing the triangles and their rulerships, and which rays, the rays of the, of the constellations and of the, uh, and of the planets, as you know, when we found out that the Sun uh, veiling um, Uranus was the ruler of Leo, immediately the seventh ray became of note, and then the fifth ray for Venus, hierarchically ruling Capricorn, and then the first ray for Pluto, so, and which rays are consequently active? It should be possible to prove then the fact of these distributed energies by the appearance upon Earth and among men of their appropriate results and the expected response. Uh, all it takes is fair-minded observation, and then we can see that they are actually working out in the world and there will be a uh, a realization that what astrology says should happen is actually happening at least those energies are visible and potent and are for all the fair-minded types to see okay we're going in then to a new uh, section and it says um, three major planetary influences today. Within the solar system itself, three of the sacred planets are peculiarly active. So first we see Uranus, Mercury, and, uh, well, Saturn. Uh, this is interesting. Why is this interesting? Because these are three of the rulers of the three constellations uh, which have been under discussion. So Uranus uh, rules not only Leo, but uh, is related to, uh, to Pisces. And Mercury uh, is related to Capricorn. And Pluto, well, is it Pluto? Let's see. Um, Saturn. It's Saturn. And Saturn to Leo. So these are precisely the three which uh, have been considered as conduits of the three um, constellations which have been studied as a triangle. But probably DK will interpret them now maybe in a different way. Let's see. Uranus the, this planet is the exoteric ruler of Aquarius. It is also the esoteric ruler of Libra and the hierarchical ruler of Aries. So that, of course, would relate Aquarius, Libra, and Aries. It is peculiarly active at this time and brings in the energy of the seventh ray. The circulating of its energies can be portrayed by the following symbol or uh, diagram. And here, uh, here we have been able... To cut and paste this diagram, um, Aries, Aquarius, Libra, all ruled by Uranus. And the Earth, which has a very close relationship in mythology to uh, the Uranus, uh, the Heavenly One. And they have much in common, actually, in terms of their rays. Uranus has a strong third ray, as the Earth does. Uranus has a strong first ray, monadically, as the Earth does. And... The Earth has a secondary soul, and Uranus, interestingly, is associated um, in a line of descent from Sirius, going through Pisces, with the second ray. So there's much in common with these uh, two, and uh, 
the earth is um, in close relationship to this far greater planet. Aries and Libra will bring in the energies of the great bear. We have been told an Aquarius is always associated in some manner with the uh, great bear. So let us see what DK is going to say about these. And I think the thing we'll do here is refer to this diagram, which will, I think, allow us to uh, switch back and forth with greater ease. Um, the triple inflow of seventh ray energy, colored by the force of three great constellations, is potent to affect major changes in our little planet. Well, what do we mean by a triple inflow? Uh, whoops. I think what we have to do here is do this. We have to say that um, each of the constellations is ruled by Uranus uh, in one way or another. And via this rulership, the energy of the constellation reaches the Earth. Um, the uh, connection of Uranus to the Earth, I think it brings in the energy of the creative hierarchies particularly. And there is such a commonality there in the rays, uh, and Earth is passing through a great uh, revolution at this time, that there is a close connection. Also, I believe, in the distribution of solar systemic uh, kundalini, there is uh, a close connection with Uranus and maybe one other Saturn planet. It might be Saturn. So this is kundalini in the solar system. They have a connection. This triple inflow of seventh ray energy via Uranus, I would say, right? Colored by the force of three great constellations is potent to affect major changes in our little planet. Changes uh, towards initiating, inaugurating the new age, uh, changes towards uh, a balancing of the forces, changes towards group consciousness. It is interesting to realize that Aries a name for Aries, the inaugurator, is rendered effective on Earth through the organizing potency of Uranus. Aries does bring in the seventh ray as well as the first. So two rays which are connected with Uranus, the seventh and the first, are strongly represented in Aries with Uranus as the hierarchical ruler. So Aries is the source, the beginning, and the initiator of the new age and its coming civilizations. And of course, Uranus always has to do with uh, inaugurating the new. It's the planet of the new in the constellation of the new. Aries is the source, the beginning, and the initiator of the new age and its coming civilizations, of the appearance of the kingdom of God on earth, and also of the individual initiate into the mysteries, especially at the time of the third uh, initiation. Because uh, Aries has this connection with uh, being. It's uh, an initiation into the mysteries of being we're talking about at the third degree. Then Aquarius is the present uh, determiner of the future. So Aries is the inaugurator and um, Aquarius the determiner of the future. And this also has to do with the new. Two forward-looking planets, Uranus and Jupiter, are both rulers in Aquarius. That which is now initiated in Aries will become manifested in Aquarius. It is a sign uh, connected much with the seventh ray at this time and with the lowest level of the hierarchies where manifestation occurs. And Libra will enforce the achievement of a point of balance, or esoterically speaking, of the escape from the opposing forces at the midway point between the source and the goal. An interesting occult phrase, we realize that uh, Libra rules the royal road into Shambhala.
and the escape between the pairs of opposites. which brings us into a condition of liberation. So we have the um, Aries, the inaugurator. We have um, Aquarius, the determiner of the future. And Libra, how should we say it, the equilibrizer, bringing uh, escape and release. Equil Ibrizer. Okay. Right. So this is a very important triangle in relation to uh, progress on the earth and to entering the new age. All of these, uh, all of these will be important in the new age. Aries bringing it in, uh, Aquarius sustaining it, and Libra keeping the balance and as an air sign ruled by Uranus esoterically uh, there through very much of the new age, especially perhaps in the final uh, decanate, which is ruled by, um, ruled by Venus. So we have Aquarius, 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 Gemini, and Aquarius, Libra, with Venus as the final ruler, bringing in uh, Libra bringing in its second-ray potential and combining with the second-ray potential of Venus and producing uh, brotherly love and divine understanding. Okay. So Uranus is, let's see, what are we really dealing with here? Three major planetary influences today. So we have, uh, he's, he's presenting them to us in a different way. Um, Saturn, Mercury, and Uranus have been presented in relation to the Great Triangle, but now he's looking for other associations for these three planets. They certainly are, they're not rulers, but they are closely connected to the triangle we have been discussing, uh, Leo, Capricorn, and Pisces. But now the associations with these planets are now different. They're based on rulerships, and see what we're looking at here, the connections uh, between these planets and the constellations are now, uh, as now considered, are rulerships. And in the above, we saw three rulerships, hierarchically of Aries, Uranus, esoterically of Libra, and uh, in an orthodox manner of Aquarius. Mercury is the expression of the fourth ray energy, and this is, as you know, peculiarly related to the fourth kingdom in nature, the human kingdom. Right. Let's see if we have any good... Um, okay. So, Mercury is the expression of the fourth ray energy, and this is, as you know, peculiarly related to the fourth kingdom in nature, the human kingdom. It is the esoteric ruler of Aries, hence it leads into the mysteries, and is also the exoteric ruler of Gemini, which is the sign of the major opposites as far as humanity is concerned, and by this we probably mean soul and personality, because it, yes, because it signifies soul and personality, consciousness and form, and it is also the exoteric ruler of Virgo, the mother of the Christ child, or the form and that which indwells the form. It is finally the hierarchical ruler of Scorpio, which is the sign of discipleship. So it has many connections, and via the rulership, um, we are being connected with all of these uh, constellations via Mercury, namely Aries, Gemini, uh, and the two triple signs, Virgo and Scorpio. It's worth rereading that. It is the esoteric ruler of Aries. Hence, it leads into the mysteries. That leading in or penetrating or initiation into is always the Aries theme. Uh, and it is the exoteric ruler of Gemini, which is the sign of the major opposites as far as humanity is concerned, because it signifies soul and personality, consciousness and form. 
It is the exoteric ruler, but also the exalted planet in Virgo, the mother of the Christ child, or the form and that which indwells the form, namely the sun aspect. But the father must also be considered. Um, I am the mother and the child. I, God, I matter am. So um, we have here the, uh, I am the mother and the child. Let's see here. I think so. I am the mother and the, it looks like we have it there. Um, I am the mother and the child. I, God, I matter am. Yes, indeed. All right. Uh, so it is both the son aspect and the mother aspect, but uh, God and matter tell us that spirit and matter are found in Virgo as well. And as the hierarchical ruler of Scorpio, where the triumph takes place through the exaltation of the intuition. Probably we're going to have some triangles created here. This therefore brings into close relation four great constellations, each of which has a peculiar relation to the dualities with which man has a definite evolutionary concern. Um, I suppose with Aries, there's spirit and matter. Uh, with Gemini, there's soul and personality. With uh, Virgo, there's soul and personality, but also spirit and matter. And with Scorpio, the battle between the soul and personality particularly. So these are expressed in a unique manner for humanity through Aries, Gemini, Virgo, and Scorpio. And the following diagram uh, is descriptive of the nature of that relation. Now we're, we're going to look at these four um, constellations. I tried to cut and paste them the best I could, but did not succeed. But here they are. And interestingly, we have kind of an inverted um, pentagram in a certain respect. Um, yes, not equal uh, necessarily, but the the earth is the lowest point and the the bottom of the pentagram. The two triple signs are located here on the baseline and the uh, fire and air signs here. So we have really, we do have fire, earth, air, and water. Uh, and the earth and water are on the baseline and the fire and air on the top. Now, it says this um, brings into close relation four great constellations, each of which has a peculiar relation to the dualities with which man has a definite concern. Okay. Um, when visualizing these diagrams, the symbol should be seen in rapid revolution. Mercury, the messenger of the gods, carries to humanity a certain type of force, and this precipitates a point of crisis. Mercury is called uh, sometimes, uh, let's uh, get this correct, um, the star of conflict. So, Yeah, here we go. Uh, the star of conflict. It brings about the next great revolution which will lead mankind on to new experience, especially in connection with Aries, and to the revelation of the divinity which it is the destiny of man to reveal. Hence, um, Mercury leads into the mysteries, because that is where the revolution, uh, revelation of divinity does occur. However, we might see uh, this diagram in rapid revolution. We can imagine. We can imagine it. <clears throat> and I suppose it might all pivot around the earth and some sort of quasi-cone-like um, figure might result. But this is definitely a manifestational diagram. 
It's not the upward pointed star. It has to do with descending into, uh, into manifestation. So let's see further. Uh, okay, well, that is, what, that is what we've been given with Mercury. Let's see if there's anything else we can extract from that. Each one of these uh, constellations has a direct relationship to the Earth. The longer arm uh, is between Gemini and the Earth and Aries and the Earth, and the shorter between uh, Virgo and the Earth and Scorpio. Each one is related to, each one of the constellations is related to the other three and to the Earth, every one of them. And there is a long diagonal here. The two that are ruled by Mars, in a sense, and the two that are generally ruled by Mercury are uh, seen as creating the diagonals, and there is this uh, important crossing point, a kind of a synthesis point for all the four uh, constellations. All right. <clears throat> um, now, when visualizing these diagrams, etc., it should be seen in rapid revolution, and the rapidity, of course, pertains to Mercury. Rapidity. And now on to Saturn. This planet applies to the tests, applies the tests, and is so chosen or invoked because the third ray is not only its particular ray, but is also the ray of our planet. And we remember the close relationship between Saturn and the Earth. There is a great third ray entity. Uh, in which Saturn is the mental body and Earth is the physical body, Mars being the astral body. Esoteric Psychology, approximately page 99, 100. Um, so there is a double third ray, possibly, in Saturn, but certainly it is a third ray monad, and maybe it is manifesting as the third ray on a lower turn of the spiral. It has the first ray as well, and much that connects it with the dense physical plane, the seventh ray. So there is a connection between the third ray of our planet, which is a personality ray, and the third ray of Saturn, which is uh, not a personality ray. It's a monadic ray and perhaps a soul ray. I, I haven't quite worked that out. Other people feel they have and have given a third ray monadically to Saturn and um, also uh, as the soul ruler. So the two notes synchronize, and perhaps we're dealing with the note fa in some way. That is the third ray note. Saturn is also the hierarchical ruler of Libra, another third ray constellation, and therefore it brings to the manifestation of mankind and to the various hierarchies involved a point of crisis to which the clue and outcome lies in the recognition of balance. Balance is a great liberator. We have to understand that. as Saturn also controls Capricorn in two of its three expressions or fields of influence, it is powerful in the three fields, exoteric, esoteric, and hierarchical. In other words, exoteric in Capricorn, uh, esoteric in Capricorn, and hierarchical in Libra. So those are three fields of expression, and Capricorn is found here and also here. Uh, and if you will relate what I here say to what I have said earlier, in an earlier part of this treatise, Re Capricorn, you will see how the sign of initiation hovers over our planet, as well as over the destiny of the individual disciple. Well, uh, indeed, we have the opportunity now for humanity's initiation, and our planetary logos is passing through initiations. Capricorn may be instrumental in instigating uh, this as well. So you have, therefore, an expression of the third ray force, which the following diagram can make clear. Okay, here we have this um, figure, which again, unfortunately, would not transfer into the main text, so I can uh, go back and forth with it. So 
reviewing here that Saturn um, is related to uh, the um, planet Earth through the third ray and also related to Libra in the hierarchical sense. And so rules in three fields, exoteric, Capricorn, esoteric, Capricorn, and hierarchical Libra. And if we check what he says about uh, Capricorn, we will see how the uh, sign of initiation hovers over our planet. There is a great avatar from Capricorn who uh, still may be with uh, our planetary logos. I don't think of this as the avatar of synthesis, but as a different avatar who came uh, earlier and probably will leave later, but is still very influential in terms of the initiation process on our, on our planet. So here we have, he says, an expression of third-ray force, which the following diagram makes clear, and we will look at the diagram in the book. Libra constellationally bringing in the third ray. Capricorn does as well, and even Aquarius does, interestingly enough. We are told not only the fifth ray, but there is one reference which suggests that the constellation Aquarius distributes the third ray. Uh, one can begin with um, Aries and move in a clockwise direction, and we'll find that Aquarius is the third sign. Saturn uh, is related to all of these. Uh, it seems to complete a triangle here. Saturn is the hierarchical ruler of Libra and the ruler of the um, first decanate on the counterclockwise wheel in Aquarius. At the same time, it is also an alternate ruler of Aquarius. And Earth is off to the side, which is interesting. We'd have to ponder this. This is a, uh, a method of bringing initiation, uh, balance, uh, and group consciousness to our planet and to help with the expiation of karma. Um, a strong third-ray influence. This makes factual and clear that at this time the sign of balance and of initiation can be intelligently used to produce effects on our earth, and this they will immutably uh, do. The signs of balance, which is Libra, of course, and initiation can be intelligently used in this age of Aquarius, which we are entering via the first decanate. Many of us, not only disciples, because the humanity is the world disciple as well. So the opportunity is present to build the first part of the Antikorana, which is ruled by Saturn. It connects the mental unit with the egoic lotus itself. And there is this um, possibility of a group consciousness in the Aquarian age with great intelligence exercised as well. So, let's see. These statements conclude what I feel if necessary to say at this time. Initiation characterized by self-initiation, because the initiate is certainly uh, initiate before he is uh, technically initiated, is the demand of man today. The stars declare it and decree it. Everything has moved into position to make possible um, to make possible the initiation of humanity. Capricorn is involved in this. Uh, Libra is involved in the first initiation. Saturn subjects the human being to discipline, and Aquarius makes possible uh, increasing group initiation, uh, which will be the way that more uh, individuals can experience this and thus hold to the time-space schedule, which our planetary logos um, has conceived for himself. The hierarchy therefore intentionally collaborates uh, because, um, let's see, we'll move this here, um, because the time is right and foreseen for long ages, the, the time for which the whole of creation uh, groaneth and travaileth until the coming of the sons of God. The crying demand and aspirations of man indicate appreciation of the opportunity, and there we have, of course, Saturn in this figure. Saturn, 
um, presenting opportunity for initiation in collaboration with Capricorn and recognized understanding of the proved necessity. The crying demand and aspirations of man indicate appreciation of the opportunity and recognized understanding of the proved necessity, the necessity for this on our planet at this time if the emergence of the second ray on our planet is to prove successful. The spirit of life enforces this. These are not idle words, and perhaps we're even talking about the first aspect of divinity here. Uh, although the monadic ray of our uh, planetary logos is occultly non-effective, we know that the ray of our own monad, even though we as individuals are not sacred, that the ray of our monad is involved with soul expression from the time of the first initiation. So we've had several diagrams here. We're about to begin this section on the crosses. But let's just review a little bit these particular diagrams. Uranus, Mercury, and Saturn, three major planetary influences today, quite independent of whether or not they work in a triangle. We are bringing in the New Age via Aries, and the uh, sign of the future Aquarius is there, and Libra is rising in power in the, in the astrological chart of the planetary logos himself. All of these bringing about the transformation on Earth. Um, the Uranus can be definitely associated with the first initiation because it is an initiation ruled by the seventh ray, which Uranus as a soul uh, conveys. So here we have uh, an important triangle of transformation, bringing in um, a new order uh, and spread to all. The benefits are spread to all by the distributive quality of Aquarius, and we have right human relations entering the picture so that this distribution can really occur and not be interrupted by useless and needless conflicts. These three together uh, are uh, instrumental in applying the seventh ray in different ways to the earth. And so there is an elevation of human attention into the etheric body which uh, Aquarius uh, which uh, Uranus rules. In a way, the Aquarian age will be very much an age of the discovery of the ethers as a new frontier, and we will expand our knowledge of what physicality really means. Then we go to Mercury and see an interesting uh, diagram here. Um, it is the possibility of of linking the cosmic ethers with the earth and uh, of overcoming the great uh, battles which this star of conflict uh, is related to. Every one of these signs has its connection to duality, Aries, particularly with spirit and matter, and um, it relates uh, uh, being to our usual uh, um, world revealed by the senses. A Gemini will uh, create the interplay of the soul and personality or of, uh, of consciousness and form and make their intercommunication possible on the earth. So there's inauguration and um, uh, bipolar uh, communication or communication between the poles. There is also the factor of fusion of the soul and personality in Virgo. The son and the mother are fused. Uh, we have not only communication between that which is of the higher mind and that which is of the lower mind, but we have their fusion and integration under Virgo. And, um, well, whenever Scorpio enters here, there is a battle to ensure that the third aspect remains the servant of the second aspect and does not trap the second aspect of consciousness in any form of vice represented by the hydra. 
So all of this has to do with the resolution of the dualities within humanity and upon the earth. And when you remember that our uh, earth uh, graduates are called adjudicators between the pairs of opposites, and how particularly the great war, the fourth ray war between soul and personality, is prominent on our planet, we can see how these um, four constellations ruled by the star of conflict bring the pairs of opposites into the uh, correct condition and uh, relieve them from their inharmonious state. Eventually, um, these opposites, let's say the secondary soul and third ray personality of the earth, are resolved through the intermediary ship of these four constellations. And then, moving just a little further to what we've just done, uh, here is here are three uh, great signs of intelligence. Aquarius rules the um, universal mind. Libra rules the super mind. It's probably the atmic mind. Saturn, a great uh, planet of intelligence with its third ray monad, uh, ruling the uh, plane on which the super mind is found. Ruling the plane of Libra, the atmic plane. Capricorn, the major sign of initiation. All of them conveying the third ray, but somehow lifting the third ray. Capricorn reveals the secret of the soul. Uh, Libra gives us a divine love and understanding. We learn on page 333, not just the third ray aspect. Um, Aquarius has to do with universal love. So these are all effective um, in bringing about the opportunity to transfer the third ray to the second ray, to transfer the personality aspect to the soul aspect. Well, friends, this has been, I think, uh, a difficult section in a way. You'd think if we simply look at three important planets for today. Now, they are planets which were definitely connected with the three constellations we have been studying. But he is giving us the rulership connections and how they all uh, work together, um, how they all work together to elevate our Earth. Uranus and Mercury, one the higher octave of the other, and Saturn and Mercury being so important both at discipleship, except the discipleship particularly, and also at the time of the fourth initiation, interestingly enough. I would have preferred to be able to transfer these uh, diagrams right to the word text, but uh, unfortunately this program is playing tricks on me or I'm just failing to notice something that is uh, an, an easy fix. So I will um, let this go for now. We are about ready to start a new section, a very, very important section. So this is right now the end of Esoteric Astrology Adventure 136A. I think I'll just leave it at that. And we're on page 550 and beginning of Esoteric Astrology Adventure 137A, page 550, and we will begin uh, tomorrow if possible with the charts, uh, with the study of the crosses. We've been studying the spiritual aspect which is the triangles of consciousness, the triangle hovering above the square. And how interesting when you think about initiation, Capricorn is in the form of a triangle. It is a triangular constellation ruled by Saturn connected with the atomic plane. And we are being told that uh, if we connect here what is said with what is earlier said about Capricorn, you will see how the sign of initiation hovers over our planet, as well as over the destiny of the individual disciple. And really, what is going on here is that the triangle is hovering above the square. Our planet in a, is, in a way, a square. Its etheric body is filled with squares, which have to be made into triangles. Um, Capricorn is turning those who are uh, trapped in the square uh, into free agents within the triangle, or freer agents. So our home becomes the triangle and no longer the square, and the etheric body does reflect this. So uh, 
we actually have kind of a parallelogram here, don't we? Um, it is, in a way, the... Well, there are several things going on with this diagram. It is the uh, n diamond of triangular circulation that we have been seeing, but it's, it's uh, put on its side as a parallelogram. And um, that, I think, for good reason. Um, the line to Earth and Saturn has yet to be drawn. We have all of these somehow connected to the Earth, but we do not have them directly connected. They seem to be mediated through Aquarius, uh, which will introduce Saturn uh, to humanity in a very forceful way through the first decanate, and thus, through the introduction of Saturn, bring in the strong uh, Libra and Capricorn. It's a very much of a third ray triangle, but as I said before, uh, the problem is to elevate the third ray into the second, the personality ray into the soul ray, and the opportunity under Saturn is there to do that because each one of these constellations carries not only the third ray, but is definitely connected with the soul, as I've been trying to, to say. The marriage of the soul with the personality under Libra, uh, Capricorn revealing the secret of the soul and Aquarius being a sign uh, of universal uh, universal love and the life more abundant. So through this triangle, perhaps of great intelligence, there can also be an elevation toward the second aspect. Um, this is possible. All right, friends, I think I, I will not go on any more today. There have been seven programs here. <laughs> and um, but since we're starting an entirely new section on the crosses, I think that's what I'll deal with tomorrow. So for the time being, farewell, and we'll see you before long with uh, Esoteric Astrology Adventure number 137A. Okay, bye-bye.